All right. This is the last Sunday of 2014. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to share with you a celebration message. But today, God's put a message in my heart that I believe you might call it a challenging message. I, mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Amen? We need to be challenged every once in a while. You know, I'm not here to entertain you. I mean, I might crack a joke every once in a while, but that's just a byproduct. And some of you say that's not really funny anyway. But uh, uh, I'm here to make disciples. That's what I'm called to do. That's what you're called to do, amen? We are called to make disciples. So this morning I want to talk to you about being a committed believer. And as I look at the church, not necessarily just our church, but the church, I see two different kinds of believers. And there are some in between, but I see a casual believer and I see a committed believer. And a lot of casual believers have the appearance of a committed believer. However, when you take a closer look at them, you'll see that they are in fact a casual believer. They want to talk like they have a committed relationship with Christ. But as we observe the lifestyle, it simply does not line up with that of a committed believer. They're half-hearted. There's, there's a half-hearted commitment at best. Now, I don't want to come off as condemning, and I think if you know my heart, you, you know that as your pastor. However, I do not believe it is wrong to identify and to talk about such things as commitment, obedience, or the lack thereof. Amen? And I think it's sad that there are so many in the church today who have little to no commitment to God's purpose or plan for their lives. And we are cheating ourselves when we do not have that commitment toward God. God calls us to do certain things because He knows that is going to bring us into our destiny. And if we are half-hearted about it, we will never reach the destiny that God has planned for us. And I'm at a point in my life where I've been a pastor for over 30 years that it gets very discouraging to me when I look around at the body of Christ and I see such a lack of commitment to God and obedience to His Word. You know, you can't really even say that word obedience in the church anymore. You'll get labeled legalistic. But I believe that the writers of the Bible of the New Testament talk about obedience, I believe that we ought to talk about obedience to God and to His Word. I can remember back in the 70s, we used to talk about being sold out to Jesus. Everybody remember Carmen? By the way, which is a miracle. Yes. He beat cancer whenever they said there was no hope. But he used to sing songs about being sold out for Jesus. Being a soldier in the army of God. But you rarely hear that kind of talk anymore. But we need to remember the Bible does talk about being committed. The Bible does talk about being a soldier in His kingdom. So, what does it mean to be committed to Jesus? Commitment is following Jesus. And commitment demands a choice. I was talking to Mark Jr. the other day because he's going to be baptized along with Kylie. And I was telling him that salvation is a gift. And salvation is a gift. When we receive salvation, we're born again. That means we become baby Christians. You're, you're a baby, you're an infant spiritually when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the point is, we do not want to remain spiritual, spiritual babies. We want to grow just like we want to grow physically. I mean... 
We look kind of silly crawling around on the floor, taking our socks off. When we're 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. Amen? We look a little silly being even 12 years old sucking on a bottle. It's natural for a baby to do it, but there's, uh, there's supposed to be stages in our walk with God that we grow from crawling to walking to running. Unfortunately, there are many believers that are not followers of God. There are many believers that are not disciples. You know what a disciple is? A disciple is a learner. We are to be learners of Christ. Students of His Word. And I know I probably sound like a broken record. You know, those are two basic foundational principles of growth is prayer and the Word of God. But yet, many, many Christians do not spend time in either one of them. And we wonder why we're not growing as Christians. You know, we're not to do it as a religious duty. We do it to grow, to be nurtured. To grow in our faith. To grow in our walk with God. As Christ's disciples, we are asked to voluntarily put ourselves under His authority and do His will His way. If you're not doing that, then you're not really a disciple. Amen? Too many Christians want to do it their way. We rarely ask God, how do you want me to do it? How do you want me to handle this situation? How do you want me to go forward from here? Lord, whatever you say, I'll do that. You don't see that a lot in the church today. It's what makes me happy, what makes me comfortable. Sometimes God will call us out of our comfort zone. He will stretch us if we allow Him to do so. The Bible gives many examples of courageous commitment. Peter was crucified upside down due to his commitment to follow Christ. Stephen was stoned to death because of his commitment to Christ. And it could go on and on. Paul was put into prison. Paul was beaten. He was left for dead. He was kicked out of more than one town. And eventually, Paul was killed because of his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, there are people who are uh, persecuted, tortured, and killed because of their commitment to Christ. Here in America, if we're told, well, you need to obey God's Word, oh, how dare you tell me what to do? So if we're supposed to be committed, here's a good question. How can we know if we're committed or not? How can we know if we're sold out to God? Well, to do that, I want us to take a look at the life of Daniel this morning. And, 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 and in the book of Daniel, we're going to see seven signs of commitment. Now, there are more than seven, believe me. But for sake of time, we're going to look at seven of them this morning. And when we look at Daniel... We see that his commitment began as a young, at a young age as a teenager. In Daniel uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, we see Daniel stood up for what he believed in, choosing not to defile his body with any impure thing. In Daniel 1 8 it reads, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And I'd just like to speak to teenagers for a moment. You're not too young to stand up for God. Do not give in to peer pressure. Do not let peer pressure guide you. Let the Word of God guide your choices in life. Because life is about choices. You make the wrong choice today, you'll pay for it tomorrow. But you can make the right choice tomorrow and begin to turn things around. Amen? Follow the Word of God. And I guarantee you, your life will be abundantly blessed. Amen? Then we come to Daniel chapter 6. We've seen him as a teenager. Then in Daniel chapter 6, we find Daniel now in his 80s, but his commitment to God has not waned one bit. People who are committed to God, first of all, 
have an excellent spirit. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, it reads there, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Daniel's excellent spirit was seen in the way that he handled himself. It was seen in the way that he treated other people. If you have an excellent spirit, you will handle yourself differently than how the world handles itself. You will treat people differently than other people treat individuals. It was also seen in the way that he served God. If you were on trial for having an excellent spirit, as the old question is asked, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Not only did he have an excellent spirit, but those who are committed to God live clean lives. You know, we kind of have a mindset today that anything goes. You know, we're saved by grace. God's grace is great. God's grace is wonderful. It really doesn't matter what we do because God's already paid the price. God has made, paid the price. And you will not get to heaven because of what you do or don't do. But we still have a responsibility to live a committed life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And His grace is what enables us to do that. It tells us that His grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. His grace is what gives us the power to overcome. It reads in verse 4, chapter 6 of Daniel. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Now here's what gets me. Daniel wasn't even born again. <coughs> Daniel did not even have the Holy Spirit living in him. But yet it says there was no fault or error found in him. Isn't that interesting? You know, there are a lot of bumper stickers that you see today that say, you know, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. It is true that we will probably make a mistake. But when people look at our hearts, they should see that our intent is perfect. We, they should see that we're not lackadaisical about sin in our life. Amen? We're not to take sin lightly. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, it tells us that we are to live above reproach. It reads there, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach. Now, is there anything in your life we need to ask that question that people can point to and say that's immoral. Is there anything they can point to and say that's contradictory to the Scripture? Or say that's just plain wrong? Is there, if there is, the Bible says we're to repent of that, amen? We're to turn away from that. People who are committed to God are faithful. In verse 4, it also says Daniel was faithful. In other words, Daniel is the kind of person that God could count on. Don't you want to be that kind of person? Be the kind of person that God can count on? Is God in control of your life? Can God trust you? If your answer is no, then we need to ask the question, why? And whatever that reason is, we need by the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to turn away from that so that we can be a person that God can trust. If I ask you if your spouse can trust you and you answer no, then there's a problem. If you ask me if I can trust Cheryl, I would quickly answer yes. And I would hope she would say the same about me because there's a trust relationship there. A committed person lives according to God's Word. 
in verse 5. It reads, Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now this is interesting. The only way thing they can find against him is that he followed God's word more than the king's commandment. Now let me tell you, I've made plenty of mistakes. I don't, you know, when I get from behind this stand and off this platform and go about my business, I got to live this just like you do. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't give me any extra bonus points. Amen. But I can remember, you know, I, I said that to say this. I remember one of the first churches I pastored, I got put on trial because these people didn't like the way I did things. And I won't go into a lot of detail here. But I really was. I was put on trial. They brought in the, the leadership, the presbyter and, and assistant presbyter and you know the, the big shots in the, 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 the state. And they basically asked, what are your charges against this pastor? You want to hear my charges? He doesn't use a King James Bible. I use the New King James Bible. Oh, here's one against Cheryl. She used the Bible to teach Sunday school class. Okay. You know, she didn't use the little quarterly thing. What was one of the other ones? Oh, I used too many scriptures when I preached. Now, I don't know about you, but I can stand before God and say I'm guilty. <laughs> now, not that I don't have things they may have found, unfortunately, but this is kind of where Daniel was. They couldn't find anything immoral in his life. They couldn't find where he was going against Scripture. They just found where he stood upon the Word of God rather than the commandment of the king. And that's where they're going to try to nail him at. Daniel was faithful. He lived according to God's Word. Daniel had studied the Scriptures and he was living them out. Amen? What are some of the areas in our lives in which we can be obedient to God's Word? Well, I've got a few I want to share with you. First of all, go to church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it reads, "...not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together." as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. That means exhort them to come into the house of God. Amen? Exhorting one another. So much more. I mean, church, more so today than ever before as you see the day, the day of the return of Jesus Christ coming. Now, when we talk about going to church, I'm not talking about as a religious duty. Well, I guess I have to go to church. I'll tell you one thing, and this is not going to be popular because it's such a popular saying, but I don't like it. Well, I'd rather be golfing thinking about God than in church thinking about golfing. Well, if you're in church thinking about golfing, then you are a casual Christian. You're coming because of religion. You're not coming because of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the body of Christ. Yes, you can think about God while you're golfing, but you don't have to do it on Sunday morning. Amen? Amen? You see, coming to church involves a lot of things. For one, it's corporate worship. It's coming together with brothers and sisters to lift up the name of Jesus and to magnify Him and glorify Him together. It's coming to hear the Word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it might sink into your heart and, and encourage you or challenge you or whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life that moment. Coming to church is not just for you, but it's for your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're selfish if we come just to get what we can get out of it, but we come to give to others. A pat on the back, a hug, a smile, a word of encouragement. You see, this is body ministry. The ministry doesn't just take a start whenever we start playing the music and worshiping God. It starts out in the foyer when you may be blessing somebody and ministering to somebody just because of a word of encouragement that you give them. Or afterwards when you shake somebody's hand and, and say something to them. And you may not even realize that it's anything at all that you said, but they walk out of here going, man, that blessed me. 
It's not all about the worship team and the pastor. It's about all of us. It's body ministry. And we come together to minister to one another, exhort one another, encourage one another. That's what it's about. Also, it's about the body of Christ. We are, as a local church, a picture of the universal church. See, the, the, the world cannot really see a universal church. They see individuals out there. But when we come together as a body, they can see the church in action. Amen? You know, when we came together and made up those little shoe boxes and sent them all, that's a picture of the church. Amen? But we come together to work together in the ministry. We can live according to God's Word by being a witness. Acts 1.8 says that we're to be witnesses. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That doesn't mean every one of us are going to go out knocking on doors. But it does mean that we're going to live our faith openly. We're going to give people an opportunity to ask for the reason that we have hope. As the Holy Spirit leads us, we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, another thing that gets me, and you talk to people, well, I'm a very religious person, but that's just between me and God. It's private. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your Christianity is private. It's to be exposed for the whole world to see. We live according to the Word by ministering. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, it says we are to minister. It reads, for the equipping of the... Now, that's what I'm here for as a pastor, to equip you. Did you get that? I'm not here to do ministry for you. I'm here to equip you to do ministry. Amen? Equipping the saints, that's you. That's not, you know, Sister Joanne that went to be with the Lord 20 years ago. You've heard me preach this before with my bad grammar. Either you're a saint or you ain't. Amen? If you're a born-again believer, you're a saint. It says, for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, we are not saved to set on our blessed assurance. Amen? We are saved to work for God. You know, if it was just get saved so you can go to heaven, we ought to have altar calls. Do you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Go on then. I mean, if that's all there is. No, we're here to work. Amen? We're here. We all have a ministry of reconciliation. And that is bringing... People to, to God through Jesus. And, and telling them that he's a, a, he, a, he, salvation is a gift through Jesus. <clears throat> we can live according to God's Word by putting others' needs before our own. It reads in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. If you're living according to God's Word, you're not going to be selfish. You're going to be giving. Amen? If we're going to live according to God's Word, it tells us we're to tithe. In Malachi 3.10 it says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Why? That there may be food in my house. Now I know very few people that give that are against tithing. Most people that want to argue tithing are people that don't give. Some claim that's, that's Old Testament. No, we're not under law to tithe, but the tithe was established before the law was established. If you study the New Testament, you'll find that tithing or 10% is just a starting point. And we could go look at several verses. That 10%, and that's what tithe is, it means 10%. If you get 10 apples, guess what? One apple goes to God's kingdom. Amen? 
It's my belief that if one is committed to God, they'll have no qualms about being generous. And generously giving to God through His church. I believe the closest thing that we have to a storehouse is the church. He said there might be food in my house. What are you getting right now? Food, amen? Yeah, sometimes you get catered in meals, but that's not what it's talking about. That there might be food, spiritual food, feeding of the Word of God, prayer. You know, when we give, you know, sometimes we talk about the utilities and this. It ain't, it's not about paying utilities. All that does is give us the opportunity to come together in a place to, to do all that we do, to worship, to, to praise Him, for teaching, for instructing the children, for youth events, for uh, uh, we give to missions, we give to benevolence. We do so many different things, and we do that because you bring your tithe into the storehouse. Amen? Sometimes I, I, I get uncomfortable talking about money, but you know, I said something the other day that really hit me. Why should I be uncomfortable? It's your church too. You know? Okay, I made some side notes here. Let me see if I got them all. We're good. Number five. Pray regularly despite the consequences. We read in Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, and he wasn't supposed to do this, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God and was as was his custom since early days. Daniel knew what the king's order said. You shall not pray to anyone but him. Amen? Daniel knew the penalty for breaking that law. It could be death. It could mean his death. But Daniel prayed anyway. Amen? Many Christians today are too timid to pray over their meal in public. It would be embarrassing. I don't think we need to make a show of it, but man, that could be encouraging to other people just to bow your head and to say a little prayer and of thanksgiving. You know, a lot of times my prayer gets to be very routine, but I still think it's better than just diving in without pausing for a moment to give thanks. Number six, when we're committed to God, we impact the lives of others. In uh, chapter 6, verse 25 through 28, Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before God, the God of Daniel. For He is the living God, and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and His dominion shall endure till the end. He delivers and rescues, and He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel's commitment won the king over. And I believe our commitment will win the world over. Our commitment may win our neighbors over. Our commitment may win our co-workers over to God. Amen? Daniel's commitment showed the power of God. Daniel's commitment turned the kingdom toward God. And church, we need to believe for big things. We actually need to believe that our commitment could turn this city toward God. You know, if you're going to dream, dream big. Amen? You might be surprised at what a committed believer can do. There's been whole revivals that started. Whole city revivals because one man took his lunch hour to pray. People's lives can be changed. When people look at our lives, what are they going to see? A casual believer? Or are they going to see a committed believer? The good news is this. You have a choice to make. Amen? You have a choice to make. Now I realize it's not black or white. I realize it's a growth process. But what's in our heart? Is it in our heart to be committed or are we satisfied 
with just being casual. You know, there's other names I could use. These are the politically correct names. These are the nice way of saying it. Amen? I don't want to be casual. I don't want to be lukewarm. Amen? I want to be on fire for God. I want people to see my commitment to God and His people. Number seven. This sign of, com uh, uh, of commitment of a believer is not found in Daniel. Actually, this sign of commitment is our very first act. of obedience as a believer. And that's baptism. We're told to be baptized. We're commanded to be baptized. What's the big deal about baptism? Well, first of all, if you're not born again, if you're not saved, the only difference is you'll go in a dry center and you'll come out a wet center. This will not save anybody. We do this because we are saved. You see, God does such a work in our hearts when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So much takes place. I want to look at one more verse of Scripture. And Jake, if you would put this up there for me, Romans 6, 4. You see, God wants us to understand what has taken place so much that He commands us to be baptized because baptism basically is acting out what God has done in. It's acting out what the Holy Spirit has done within our hearts. And it reads there in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we were baptized buried with Him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism, first of all, is a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But just as it says here that we were buried with Him through baptism. And this is a picture of our death with Christ. When we go under that water, it's a picture of the old us dying. The old man dying. And it says we're raised in newness of life. And, and we should walk in that newness of life. Amen? And, that, and, and God wants us to understand that we are a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what this is a picture of. Not only for those that are candidates for baptism, but as we observe, we are reminded ourselves that that old me died. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad the old Jew's dead? And you know, some people say, yeah, well, he's dead, but he sure does resurrect every once in a while. No, that's not the case. There's still this thing called renewing the mind. Amen? You know, we had an old way of doing things, and now we need to learn a new way of doing things. But that old man's dead. That old sinful nature is dead. We now have the nature of Christ. Amen? He took our sin and gave us His righteousness. That means that we now have right standing before God. And when we're baptized, again, that's what that is a picture of. It's a picture of the old man dying, and are being raised again, born again. We're now a spiritual baby, and we're ready for this thing, amen? We're ready to say, I'm setting my sights toward the goal of the high calling of God, and I, I choose to be committed, and I'm starting right now with water baptism, being obedient to what He's called me to do. And church, when you are obedient with that first act of obedience, it, gets, it sets you up to continue a life of obedience. It's when we don't get baptized that it sets us on a path of struggling to be obedient. Amen? 
So if you're getting convicted, you know, we have plenty of water up here. It's almost warm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today, we're going to have Mark Jr. and Kylie be baptized. And we, I've talked to both of them individually about what being baptized means. And both of them have made a decision for Christ. And I'm excited about that. I mean, the church, this is what we live for. People making decisions for Christ and to follow Christ. Amen. And they're following Him in obedience uh, through baptism this morning. So, we're going to... Kylie, if you would come, please. How's the water? <laughs> we'll give Kylie a moment to adjust <laughs> to this water. <laughs> oh, God. Like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Kylie, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Believe me, it's been colder than this before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on now. You're bad. I didn't do that. You're not that bad. Oh, man. This worse. Mark, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the decisions that have been made for your son by Mark and by Kylie. Lord, I pray that you would just become so real to them in the coming days. I pray, God, that you would just move through them, and Lord, that they would live and move and have their being in you. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to just minister to them by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.